Father, we are grateful to you. We look up to you alone, O Lord, to learn at your feet. Lord, we pray that you will open unto us rivers of life from your throne. You will quicken our understanding in the inner man. In mercy, O God, you will visit us. You will strengthen us. You will encourage us in our inner man. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Today we are starting by looking at Philippians 1 29. The passage I believe every Christian should know. <laughs> Philippians 1 29. We will just go through some scriptures here and there. So Philippians 1 29 says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. So two things are given to us. We have been given to believe in the Lord Jesus. We have also been given to suffer for his sake. The best suffering you can suffer on earth is to suffer for the sake of Jesus. That means that if not for Jesus, you will probably not have gone through that kind of suffering. Such a suffering will not come your way. It is given to you. It is part of the gift of God for you. <laughs> it is part of the blessings of God in your life. And do you know we experience this every day, but we don't take it to heart. The person you marry, Whatever before that person, do you know befalls you also? You will suffer with the person, whether you like it or not. That suffering that is an is um is the proof that you have associated with that person. You will suffer with that person. If something happens to your spouse, it will affect you also. The same thing also happens to countries. Whatever country you live in. You will suffer with them. <laughs> we have not had electricity supply for three days now. You know, we have to suffer it. If I was probably in a country where they have 24 hours electricity, I would also enjoy 24 hours electricity. So you see, wherever you belong to, you are going to face whatever they are facing in that place. So, how would we know that we belong to Jesus if we do not suffer for his sake? So that's why that suffering, it's a blessing. That's why the disciples of Jesus, they rejoiced when they suffered. You know, when they took Peter and flogged him like a baby in the public. The Bible said they went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the sake of Christ. To suffer shame. Can you suffer shame for the sake of Christ? Can you rejoice for suffering shame for the sake of Christ? So we need to remind ourselves of this basic thing because sometimes um, in our quest for things, people have brought up all kinds of scriptures to speak wonderful, wonderful things. But some of these basic things are being forgotten. We are raising a generation that do not want to identify with Jesus through suffering. We don't want to identify with Jesus through shame. It is part of our calling. He say it is for unto you. It is given on behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. To suffer. Suffer. Suffering for his sake. Now, when you also read this, you may mistake it and think that what that means is that if somebody says, will you believe, will you deny Jesus or we should kill you? Now, you feel that that kind of a suffering means I am suffering for Jesus' sake. That is true. But it's not only limited to that. Did you know that Satan can unnecessarily frustrate your life? Makes life, make life difficult for you. If I scripture say they that will live righteous in this world must suffer persecution. There are things you will face certain challenges that if not for Christ, you, you won't go through such a suffering. 
Some you may not even know that it is for the sake of Christ you are going through this challenge. You won't even you may not even know. So it is given to us to suffer um, for his sake. And we are saying that some of those sufferings can be very silent. You have a spouse that speaks to you, you know what to say, you know what to reply. But because of Jesus, you keep your peace. <laughs> you know how to deal with the situation. If you want to deal with that spouse, you know what to do. But you give it up to God. Okay? Don't feel bad. Don't don't pity yourself. Don't say, if not for Jesus. Yes, if, yes, you should be grateful. It's a blessing for us to suffer for his sake. There are things other people can do that you cannot do. Okay? There are things that people can change their age because they want to get a job. People can change their age because they are applying for a visa. You know, people can do fake marriage. You know, fake marriage is, is simply lying. You know, a Christian does not tell lies. The Bible says, let him that lie. Let him lie no more or let him speak the truth. Jesus said, you lie like your father who is a liar from the beginning. A Christian does not tell lies. So how can a Christian be involved in a fake marriage just to get certificate? So you go and marry somebody and say, we are married, even though you have a wife. Back maybe in Africa, then you go to Europe or America or Canada, and then you say, you go and marry somebody just to obtain certificate. And then later you now divorce that person. You know, all of that is lying. The Bible says, flee every appearance of evil. is deception. You want to deceive that system. You want to cheat that system. A Christian does not cheat. A Christian does not do those kind of things. Somebody asked me, said that uh, uh, she would like to help a brother. I said, it's good to help a brother. Uh, she said, well, she needs to marry the brother in order for the brother not to get deported. I said, did you really want to marry him as in he becomes your husband? She said, no, 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 no. Oh, just fake marriage. She said, yes. I said, how can you as a Christian do that? That is not help. That is sin. That's not help. So you see, other people can do these things. And they will say, well, you see, we are, we are over here. We are doing well. <laughs> but you know that they have to use a corrupt means. To secure whatever they have. You can't do that as a child of God. And they may look at you as a failure. Because you know that you cannot, you can't compromise. You can't go for visa interview and lie. As a Christian. Some people will lie. Do all kinds of deceitful things. You know, I saw somebody went to the American embassy and look at the foolishness. He claimed to be married. So he had to supply pictures of his marriage and different pictures. So you know what he did? He just took one picture, his own picture, and cropped it and fixed it on picture of somebody who actually got wedded and printed that. So they could see, he, he thought they were fools. They could see that it is the same face on all the pictures, the same pose of the face in all, all the pictures. Even the one where he was dancing, the one where he was cutting the cake, we were at the marriage registry, the, the face was looking exactly the same. So they showed it. As a Christian, you can't do that. And that may mean that you do not secure a visa. You know, this, these are basic things some people don't know today. So they just feel that, no, why can't we do this thing? No, you can't do that as a Christian. You can't say, I'm a follower of Jesus and be involved in deceitful practices. You can't. You, you simply cannot do that. You can't say, I want to go and marry and I will divorce later just to secure a paper. Is it God that is sending you to do that? And then you now say, Jesus is the owner of your life. How? How is he the owner of your life? You are the one controlling your own life. Sin is the owner of your life. But you can repent can repent and come to Jesus. We don't do those kind of things. Christians don't do that. We would rather suffer than for us to manipulate. Do you, do you know what 
Do you know some of the challenges documentation poses for Christians? At different levels. And the one system, they don't care. They, they created that system. For you to, to fit. Sometimes I have document, I have problem just filling documents. Because the system itself does not expect you to be truthful in the filling of those documents. At various levels. You will just be contemplating, okay, what do I put here now? What do they want me to write here now? If you are truthful to the core, the application will be, will become useless. <laughs> you see, so, you see, we suffer certain things for the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ. Let's look at other scriptures. Let's just encourage our hearts. Okay. It's a blessing, though. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. It says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Can you see? Earlier we read that it is given unto us to suffer on behalf of Christ. Now we are reading that we are appointed to these afflictions. All the afflictions that Paul went through, he, he didn't see it as something to be bitter towards people. He says, see, I was appointed unto this affliction. Don't, don't let it break your heart that I suffer. He doesn't want anybody to pity him. He says, see, these afflictions, I am appointed to go to, we are, he said, for yourself know that we, plural. So he wasn't referring to himself. We are appointed thereunto. We are appointed thereunto. If you go to verse three, verse four, what can I just say? For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Look at what they told him. Look at what he said. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Many of you will not listen to Paul. <laughs> if Paul was alive today, many Christians today will hate Paul. Since we should, we should suffer tribulation. Today, we don't even understand some of these things. Somebody is abusing an elderly man in Christianity. You will now leave what God has called you to do now. To be fighting the, pe the person who is abusing an elderly Christians. Or elderly Christians. Those that you think are fathers of faith. Because we do not necessarily agree that some of them are fathers of faith. They are to suffer tribulation. It is part of their calling to suffer abuse, to suffer insult. You see, the reason why people are rising up in their defense to also abuse people and display the fact that they don't have Christ in them is because these so-called leaders are themselves not letting people know that it is part of our calling to suffer affliction. They too will come out to want to defend themselves. Say, somebody is abusing me. Somebody says, is it not normal for you to be abused? Your age does not excuse you from suffering with Jesus. It is normal. It is normal for you to be abused. You should teach your followers that they should be grateful to God that somebody is abusing you for the sake of Christ. Not to raise people who will now be fighting back. So that's the kind of thing we are doing now. Cat and mouse. So you hear somebody say, I cannot be alive. And somebody will be abusing my father. I cannot be alive. A man that he doesn't know from anywhere. <laughs> and he will now get up and do a video. And abuse people. Can you imagine? Pastors, they will do videos to abuse, to curse. They will, say, they will use all kinds of foul language to describe another person. They will say, because this person is attacking their father. This person is attacking their father. What foolishness. We are appointed to suffer. And you know, 
They, you see, you we must be careful. I'm not sure some of you may have heard of cults where people died in America. America, hundreds of people they killed themselves because they were following a leader who told them to kill themselves. Did you remember in Kenya recently? Some people were killing themselves. They were not eating because they were following a leader. It has happened severally. As I speak to you, it is still happening in some places. Let me tell you how a cult starts. A cult starts when the leader cannot be questioned. Today we have preachers who will open their mouth and say that a father, a father in the Lord cannot be wrong. He may be wrong in the eyes of God, but he can never be wrong in your own eyes. What kind of foolishness is that? So even if he's wrong, he is right. Even if he's wrong, we must not say it. We must not see it. That's how cult starts. So one day, if that man said they should not eat for 365 days, they won't eat. People will start dying. It's happening, as in it's happening around us. They are, they are teaching us, they are training us not to question leaders. They see questioning of leaders as an attack. Just the fact that you are 90 years old does not give you license or liberty to preach heresy, to preach nonsense. And then you say that we must, we must accept it. Why must we accept it? Did you die for me? The souls of people are more important than your reputation. Wrong teachings, false teachings does damage to people's soul. So why must I keep quiet? Just because you are a father. No, 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 no. It's not right. You know, even my own earthly father, my own earthly father, he will be 91 years old next month. He's still alive. Some years back, when they made him an elder in the church, and I traveled home, I went to my dad. I said, Dad, you should not be an elder. You should not be appointed as an elder in the church. He said, why? I said, that our neighbor, you told me one day that you will never forgive her. I said, how can you that you cannot forgive somebody? Be an elder in the church. That this post is wrong. He should not be. <laughs> he said he had forgiven the person. I reminded him again of another wrong. I said, do you remember? He said, he has also said to that one. I said, all right. Then they can make you an elder. That's my own dad. That was not an attack on my dad. How can I, how can I be, be, um, talking to other people that this thing is right, this thing is not wrong. Then because it came to my own dad, I cannot say anything. That is not being disrespectful. It's a dangerous thing we are doing today, telling people that don't question them, don't question them. It's, it's a, I don't want to be a preacher that you cannot question. I don't want to be a preacher that people follow or believe what I say absolutely. I don't want to be such a preacher. I want you to use your head. And that's why I stick very strictly with scriptures. So that you are reading it in the Bible, you are seeing it. Otherwise, how, how do you say it? What audacity do you have to say that a father can be wrong, but before only before God, he cannot be wrong before us? Many people that they call fathers of faith, if there's one thing that is common to all of them, is that they've mostly been wrong. They've led the church into error. Some of them started doing things that remain a practice today that have no basis in the scriptures. Just imagine if there is there are no people who are looking at the Bible, who are examining the Bible, who are saying this thing is not right, this one is not right. Do you know what will have happened today? When somebody brought a stick, a stick, a stick, and raised it, and he said people should look at that stick and ask anything they want. Let's be honest with ourselves. Is that Christianity? But we must not speak out. It is this lack of speaking out that is making them to do it. Did you know, now that people are challenging what they are doing, they are very careful of what they do. 
before they say anything that is not correct now they will now say hey some people will say so let me read the bible they will not be looking for bible verse to justify what they want to do and then you will as if as if we are here to honor fathers and to worship father we are not worshiping men christianity is not about fathers it's about jesus there is no man more important in the scheme of God than Jesus. Nobody. Peter said, judge for yourself. Shall we obey man rather than God? Say, judge for yourself. You may be elders, you may be elders, but this issue, we will not listen to you. We will obey God. Imagine the younger generations coming. We are filling them with errors and wrong doctrines. And you are telling us that we must not speak. Fathers cannot be wrong. And many people have believed it. Did you know that I've seen people who have unfriended me on Facebook? And they, they even told me why they unfriended me. They said, somebody unfriended me and said, he can never be a friend with me. Because I attack fathers. I've not even said anything against our own father. <laughs> she said, hey, because, because you're always attack, attacking fathers. Please, what fathers are we attacking? This, that's to tell you how deeply rooted in their soul this error has gone into. That you think that if we read scriptures and we say this is not right this is not scripture what this man is saying is not correct they call it attack they have been, they have been so brainwashed to believe that anything that their father and their law says is, is is what it is their father and their lord is their christianity is their god is their lord did you know these people cannot defend jesus did you know these people cannot speak for jesus but you will see them boiling when it comes to their father and the Lord. That's to tell you that it's an idol in their heart. Fathers can be wrong. Fathers are wrong. Father will be wrong. Young people too can be wrong. Young people too are wrong. Young people too will be wrong. We will all be there to check each other. Peter went to the house of Cornelius. When he came back, they asked him, why did you go there? He didn't say, who are you? Were you there when God called me? Who are you to be talking to fathers? All these people that go on social media and be talking to fathers. Hey, that's not the issue. The issue is, why did you go to the Cornelius, to Cornelius house? The Bible says, Peter, from the beginning, he reads the matter. That means, step by step, he explained the matter. Those are true fathers. Those are true fathers. They are not people who are teaching us heresies and we must not talk. That's not a father. And you will see many preachers today, they've made it their duty to be defending fathers, not the gospel, not Jesus. They see many of them, you see, we will all answer to Jesus. Many of them can see the evil that these fathers are doing. But they have so much said to themselves, no matter what the father does, we must, the father do, we must never say anything. We must always say they are right. Even if the fathers are misleading us like this. But we are seeing here that they are appointed to suffer. Why not allow them to suffer their suffering? Why not? Do you know how many people abuse me on a daily basis? <laughs> because I'm not popular. <laughs> Some go as far as calling me demon. Particularly my stand on titan. Ah, they don't like that one. <laughs> In fact, that's my message. That, that's the message that confirms to them that I don't belong to Jesus. <laughs> Anytime I, step, I, any teaching they see that titan is impossible. You can't tie it. You are just wasting people's time and, and defrauding them. Oh, you are, you are, you are antichrist. <laughs> Let's say I'm a popular preacher. That's the same way they will do to me. But do you know that it was part of my lot? It was part of my calling that as you go, as you go about preaching Jesus, people will say all manner of things against you. Those are things the Lord has said to me before I set out. 
So they are normal things. They are prophecy being fulfilled. Nobody should come and say, let me go and defend this. I'm, that's why I don't call anybody my son. I don't do all these father, father, son, father. No, 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 no. We don't do all of those things. All these are supposed to... No, 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 no. If I, if I want to call you, I'll call you a brother. If you offend, if you get offended, get offended. Apostleship is not a title. So if they tell, tell me that you are an apostle, I say good afternoon, brother. If you don't like it, you may not like it. Are we not brethren? They do bring apostle from heaven. Who told you that we must call you? We must call you apostle. Who told you that? We are we are appointed unto afflictions. Let people go through their afflictions. It is not your duty to defend them. Leave them. You know this thing is so simple. If God has called a man, God will defend that man. Why are you defending him? If they are genuine fathers and they are preaching the truth, leave them. Let God defend them. If I'm truly of God, let God defend me. Nobody should defend me. Let's look at more scriptures. We have looked at 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, 3, 4. Even if we go to verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 3, 7. Look at what he says again. We are still in 1 Thessalonians. You can see Paul, what he told people. Telling people, preaching to people that they will suffer. How many want, how many of you will attend that meeting? <laughs> how many of you will attend Paul's meeting in December titled, You Will Suffer? I'm praying for one day when we will see a team in December that we say, you will suffer. Because you will suffer. You don't want to hear it, but you will go through it. So we, we are just deceiving ourselves. So they will tell you, 2024, your year of, of excessive success. But 2024, you will suffer. But they are not going to tell you you will suffer. So Ruto, you don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter whether you hear it or not. If you come. So people won't like Paul. Do you think I love suffering? Do I look to you like I want to suffer? <laughs> he said, therefore, verse 7, Brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. That means Paul was saying, when we heard of your faith, we felt comforted in our affliction and distress. We felt like it worth it. So what was Paul going through? Afflictions and distress. Do you know what those two things are? Afflictions. Distress. He said, he said at a point, he said they were so pressed that they almost gave up on life. That was the apostle. <laughs> distress. When your life is stretched, is stretched. Faith is stretched. The only thing that remains is that you know there is God, you know you believe in Jesus. You don't have anything in Him. All the scripture you know, you've exercised it. You are praised on every side. Affliction and distress. He said we are appointed unto it. Let's look at Acts chapter 14, verse 22. In fact, everybody must know this one by heart. Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. Acts 14, 22. <laughs> Acts 14, 22 says, Confirming the souls of the disciples. See what we are being called disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation huh? through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God we must through much tribulation through not feel tribulation much you see when you hear tribulation you are thinking of end end of this 
the days of the Antichrist, the persecution of the church, the persecution of the Jewish nation. That's what you are thinking. No. Now, any believer truly walking in the Lord, you will go through tribulation. If your destination is the kingdom of God, you will go through tribulation. He says true. So sometimes I just I, I'm just amazed when people say, Ah, God is not this hard, though, and sincerely, God is not hard. <laughs> now I tell people, I say, if you commit a crime, if you commit a crime at age 20, that the punishment is life imprisonment. Do you know they don't care? They put you into life imprisonment. You won't have sex again for the rest of your life. Never. You'll be confined into a prison for the rest of your life. It is a human judge who gave that judgment. And there is nothing you can do against it. And you will have to abide by it. When people enter into marriage, and divorce, and you tell them that they can't remarry. They are like, "Are you saying I'm going to be like this forever? Is God not merciful?" The same human system we put people in prison for the rest of their lives, and we will obey that, and we feel that is okay. But if God says no, you too should reconcile. He said, no, 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 no. I cannot live like this. I have to enjoy my life. The Bible says, by much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Obedience is costly. And I tell people, why are you risking your life? Be careful who you listen to. See, life ultimately, what matters is where you spend your eternity. Why we are here, we will do the best we can. But what matters ultimately is where you are going to spend eternity. Whatever it will cost us to be in that place, we must go through it. Yeah, but Jesus has paid the price. Exactly the point. He has paid the price. That is why you should suffer for his sake. You are not suffering because you don't know how to go and remarry. You chose not to, for his sake, in order to please him. The Bible says Moses, he chose to suffer affliction with the children of Israel than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a while in Egypt. It was a choice. It's a choice. You can choose not to suffer with Christ. It's your choice. You can choose not to. Nobody is going to force it on you. Nobody. You know, today pastors are even preaching. Particularly if you are in Nigeria. I'm sure it's happening in other places too. A pastor came out boldly. I said it is okay to marry, to divorce, to remarry. And what was his basis? He now gave example of preachers in America who are in their third marriage. Can you imagine? This is what happens when you idolize people, you call them fathers. How can a preacher, himself a preacher, say the basis for which you can marry, remarry, marry, remarry, is that fathers in America, they marry, they remarry, and they have been blessed. What is the blessing? They have money. And it was, it's so shameful. As in, it's so shameful. And I'm like, you make people sit under this man every Sunday to listen to him. <laughs> I'm like, well, everybody, you see, everybody has responsibility for their soul. You have responsibility to your own soul. I want to get, when, I, when we get there, and they now say, ah, ah, you've taken this thing too serious. I've said, sorry. I thought it should be this serious. They say, no, 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 no. It's not that serious. I say, thank you. Thank you. Please, where's my mansion? They say, it's over there. Then I go to my mansion. 
But if we get there and you meet Jesus and he says, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Do you know you can't beg? You can't say, Jesus, wait, please, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, I beg you in the name of God. <laughs> He's God. I trust Nigerians. They will beg Jesus on that day in the name of God. Jesus, I beg you. I use God to beg you. Jesus, please, Jesus. Brethren, it's a serious matter. There will be no second chance. I'm not. Some people say, why are you scaring people? <laughs> a, a trailer is coming to hit you. I'm shouting. I'm shouting. Get out of the way. You say, I'm scaring people. I better scare you to eternal life than to comfort you into the lake of fire. It's a serious matter. We, do you know that the line between life and eternity is a thin line of a moment? Every one of us. Nobody knows his last sleep. Why should I not take it serious? Even Jesus said, be watchful. He said, be watchful. That's Jesus that brought this salvation. He said, be watchful. That we must too much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Not through few. Too much tribulation. I'm saying this to encourage your heart. I'm saying this so that you can be exceedingly happy. That you are part of Jesus. That you can suffer with Christ. That's why I'm saying this. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 verse 17. Yes, Romans 8, 17. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then yes, yes of God, and joint yes with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know, in a good marriage, when a lady marries a man, and then that they have nothing, they will suffer together. And then suddenly, this man becomes a billionaire. Do you know what automatically happens? The woman also becomes a billionaire. Because they suffer together, they are going to be glorified together. Our suffering for the sake of Christ is our identification with him. It's a mark. That's why Paul said, I bear in my mark, in my body, the, the mark of Christ. Do you know the mark of Christ? Uh, those were the mark of his sufferings. If you look at his body, he didn't say the mark of the beatings of the Romans. He said the mark of Christ. If you check the back of Paul and say, ah! Who, who beat you this deep? You will say, ah, it's the mark of Christ. Those were signs that I belong to Jesus. They are his signs that he belongs to Christ. If we, be, if we suffer with him, that we may also, we may be also glorified together. That we suffer with him, we will be glorified together. What a blessing. These are basic issue, brethren. <laughs> These are very basic things that we must keep reminding us. You see, I'm just reminding us. If we go to 2 Timothy 2.12, you see the same thing there? 2 Timothy 2.12. You'll be amazed how scripture is so accurate. Look at it again. 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. That's the Bible. Some people say he cannot deny us. He can't deny us. He said us. He didn't say unbelievers. You that you claim to believe in him, if you deny him, he will deny you. I am not making a new doctrine. I'm just reading to you what the scripture says. You know what some pastors will do? Because he doesn't agree with their doctrine. They will say, well, that word deny in Greek, in Greek it is kosos, kosos. 
So what he's saying is that momentarily I will not be happy with you, but I will embrace you in the end. That's a lie. That's not what the scripture says. <laughs> Every scripture that does not agree with them, they will say the 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 Greek, you know, the Greek is cactus, cactus. <laughs> That's when they will start looking for the Greek of that word. That's not what he says. In simple English. We don't need to go and learn Greek to understand the mind of God. He says if we suffer, if we suffer, if we suffer, if we suffer, can we be have can we have um gospel artists who be singing such song to us? If we suffer, if we suffer, if we suffer. If we suffer, if we suffer, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Jesus. You know, that's a beautiful song. No, that's not what we sing today. <laughs> that's not what we want to sing today. Hmm. I live a life of favor. That's, that's the one we like. <laughs> If we deny him, he also will deny us. Are you denying Jesus? He said he will deny you. Even Jesus said it with his own mouth. He said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you in the presence of the angels. I will say, I don't know you, you workers of iniquity. Say, if we suffer with it. So you will see the consistency. Let's look at, let's look at another scripture again. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. Does it mean we love suffering? No, we love Jesus. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 13. Look at what it says again. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Can you see? If you suffer, if you are a partaker of Christ's suffering, you shall also be partaker of Christ's glory. It's not in the all this, all these brethren understood all of this. Why are we not being taught all of these things? It's just the central idea. Somebody will just come up on a Sunday. Seven keys to financial success. Four places where money is hidden. On the pulpit. That's what you want to say. We will never hear such things. So people become discouraged when they face challenges on account of their faith. Because what they are hearing every day and what they are facing in their real life, they are completely two different things. And when we speak and say, no, this is not what you should be preaching, sir. They say, why are you attacking fathers? Why are fathers misleading children? Why are fathers preaching heresy? Why are fathers preaching falsehood? You are not a father by virtue of your age. You are a father if you are leading men to Christ. We are not to celebrate anybody, any human being. We don't celebrate any human being. We worship only God. We honor brethren. We do not celebrate anybody. God didn't call me to celebrate anybody. And I don't want anybody to celebrate me. I don't want it from the depth of my heart. I don't want it. In fact, if I read further, it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. He said, But let none of you suffer as of a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody, or in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, look at it. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let's be bold to suffer as Christians. To suffer shame, to suffer misunderstanding. Did you know that people will take you as a fool, as a Christian? Because you chose not to defend yourself. 
You chose not to fight. You know what to say. You know how to respond. <laughs> but you chose not to. And so they can, they can take you for a fool. A man that is not born again can take his wife who is born again for a fool. I've seen it. Those men themselves will say, whatever I do to her, she will not say anything. She will forgive me because she's born again. And that man will be continuing in immorality. Because he knows that this woman has no choice but to continue to forgive. We have no choice in the matter of forgiveness. It is compulsory. It is essential. In fact, you, you that is being offended, you need to forgive more than the other person needs your forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, you say your heavenly father will not also forgive you. And you don't want that situation. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed that you are suffering as a Christian. Don't be ashamed. Don't be intimidated. Don't feel bad. It's your calling. It's a sign that you are going to be glorified with Jesus. You have kept yourself. You know what other people have done to get married as a lady, but you have kept yourself. Now you are 40 years old, you are still single. Those who knew how to cut corner, they are already married. And you are, everybody is talking to you as if you are a fool. They say, why did you waste your youthful years? What were you doing when you were 20? What happened when you were 25? What happened when you were 30? You just wasted your life. You don't explain anything to anybody. Continue to live for Jesus. You have nothing to explain to anybody. Endure all of those misunderstanding on account of Christ. You know you are living your life for Jesus. You know you couldn't compromise and marry somebody that you know clearly this person is not born again. Many have gone ahead to marry people who are not saved. They are facing the music now. You know that. You refuse to do that. And so you are still single. It is better for you to remain single because you want to do it right than to be married and be in a wrong marriage. God is proud of you. You are doing the right thing. He didn't send you to this world to marry or to have a child. He sent you into this world to carry him. The question is, are you carrying Christ? Is your life being shaped and conformed to the image of Christ? That is what matters. It's not, do you have a child now? Are you married now? What is happening? Ah, is there no brother? Ah, ah brother, what is happening? Where is the sister? That's not why we are on that. Because we have made all those things to look like the, the serious issues of life. That's not why God gave birth to us. That's not why he allowed us to experience life. We have experienced life so that we can become his pleasure. And you don't need to be in marriage or to have children to be God's pleasure. If God says you will remain single for the rest of your life, so be it. These are the things they don't like to say to people. So they now start giving them false prophecy. I see your... You, you know, you will now tell somebody, instead of you to be honest with the person and say, see, sister, just go and wait on the Lord. You say, no, I... Because you want to appear as a man of God that solves everybody's problem. You now say that uh, next year, June, I see a wedding card. And Satan too has had that statement. Because you are a false prophet. So do you know what will happen? One man will now come. And everything will now look like, wow. And you, the man may even say that, jokingly, that I'm looking at getting married June next year. Bam! Something tells you, that's the man, that's the prophecy. It's about to happen. That's how you will enter into wrong marriage. Once you enter into it, you will now see that this man is a Satan. Problem now starts. The marriage, you won't enjoy. The, I want to marry, I want to marry. Now you can't enjoy. You cannot come out. 
you will be sad every day. You'll be sad. You you will regret. You'll be saying to yourself, "How I wish I remain single." False prophet. They they come to you, appearing to you that they can solve every problem. See, we can't solve problems. Oh. Only Jesus solve problem. Sometimes the solution to some people's problem is to tell them to go and suffer. Is to tell them that there is a place for long suffering. Why will long suffering be fruit be, be a fruit of the Holy Spirit if we will not suffer long? Oh, you are not prepared to tell people the truth. You just want to tell them you are Mr. Fix It. You've got all the solutions. Any problem, let them just bring it. It is a lie. Some solution is to go and tell the person, please go and pick your Bible and be reading. You don't read Bible. That's where some people's solution are. But you will just tell them and confuse it. I've seen people confused into marriage like that. That one false prophet will just say, Why? Woman, that's your husband. Husband, that's your wife. And and they too, they went and got married. They went and got married. The way people can miss, I've had people I say, how did you determine to marry this person? They say, eh, eh, well, I asked my pastor to pray and my mother in the Lord and some brethren and all of, I said, that's not how to confirm how to get married. In fact, let me say this, in case somebody young is watching this. There was a time I want to marry a particular sister. Well, is it married? But I was considering it. And I spoke with how do I describe the kind of people I spoke with to you? I spoke with genuine brethren, mature brethren, people that are truly following Jesus. Not all these fake, uh, fake, real solid brethren, elderly, mature. All of them without fail said they had peace about it. <laughs> all of them. You know why? They wanted me to be married. If you don't learn how to hear God for yourself, you will be misled. I went to the Holy Spirit. He said, there is no way with this lady. And I had to stick with the Holy Spirit. Ah, I'm grateful to God that I stuck with the Holy Ghost. I will have been misled. All of them said, it was okay. All of them said it was okay. But I said, let me talk to the Holy Spirit myself. <laughs> Everything, the word of God, my inner witness, everything points to the fact that this is not it. And years later, after I got married, she got married. An incident happened and I said, God, thank you. Thank you for saving me. So don't, don't go and say, hey, I've asked people to pray. I've asked this person. Did you know, did, did you know that there are churches that have marriage committee? That marriage committee has led people into wrong marriages. Somebody came to me last week. Don't worry that I'm digressing. I'm doing it deliberately. And she said, oh, uh, the marriage was just terrible, as in very, very. This is a marriage where this man will beat this woman and call his younger brother to come and join him to beat his wife. When his friends come, the man sleeps on their matrimonial bed with his friend. The wife will sleep in the sitting room <laughs> on the chair. As in, this woman was working taking care of house, taking care of bills. This man wastes everything, brings people in. And eventually, to the woman's face, the man started having girlfriend. And finally, marry that one, divorce that one, marry another. You know, and I said, Madam, please, how did you marry this man? The woman said they got married in deeper life. I'm like, how? How could you have married somebody like this in deeper life? That cannot be possible. You know, this, this committee system where they now tell you, don't meet each other, don't... I'm like, why will you allow people to impose on you something that you are the one that will bear the consequence? I said, you, you have responsibility to check, is this man a child of God? 
She said she was the man was even a pastor then. I said, you see, so you see, you didn't subject this man to the test of the word of God. You didn't subject him to the test of wisdom. You didn't subject him to the Holy Spirit. You just believe that since the committee has called you that a brother has come and you should be praying, and you just believe that it must be right. Who does that? And it's not just deeper. It's in, it's in many of our churches. If you don't know what you are doing, if you don't know the Lord personally, and you don't know how to meet somebody and be able to discern, is this person a child of God or not? You See, you, your life will be miserable. What will she do now? She has a child now. She's, she's, uh, she, the man has left her. She's back to square one. The man had moved on to the third or fourth marriage. I said, this man has no, you know, no dot of Christ in him at all. He said, ah, they, they said we should not meet. They said we should, are they the one that will stay in the marriage? How would you not know the man you want to marry? How, how will you know the fruit if you don't go to see the fruit? How will you know it? You will know the fruit from afar. Will you sit in America and know the fruit of a tree that is in my backyard here? He said, by their fruit, you shall know them. That means you must at least have access to the fruit. You must at least have opportunity for the person to talk, to manifest himself. People will reveal who they are and the Holy Ghost will reveal who they are with time. I deliberately digress because somebody needed to hear this. So he says, if we suffer as Christians, we should not be ashamed. Let's now round it up. Because we are just doing a reminder today that please be, re be reminded that all these things they are available. They are part of our calling. You know. So as we lay claim to great promises, these are also promises. So <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 to 12. Matthew 5, 11 to 12. If you hear what people are going through, if you hear what people are going through, ah, yeah, yeah. Please, I beg you, if you are single, I want to plead with you. Now, everywhere I go now, I'm kneeling for single people. If not that, you won't see my face. Now, I will have knelt down for you. To beg you. <laughs> Satan has set a trap for you. If you're a single Christian, just hear it. Satan has set a trap for you. He's waiting for you there. Unfortunately, many of you won't pay attention. Do you know what I realize now? It is married people now that want to learn about marriage. Single Christians are not interested. When I see the enrollment for our marriage courses, married people are enrolling for courses. Single are not enrolling for their own course. Married are now in need. They now see that it, there is a big problem here. They are looking for any solution. Singles are not yet in need. They don't care. They just feel that they, they love. They have love. It's not love. Oh. How can you see Jesus? The scripture says the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. He says you can know it. God is asking you a question. He's saying, Can you know it? But you, you can know it. You say, ah, So I love that man so much. I know that we will be great couples together. <laughs> you love him so much. Do you know his heart? If you hear what men have done to women, and I know women too have done their own. Some of you, you will not want to be married. If you really have a glimpse of what is going on, can you know a heart? Only the Lord. That's why learning Jesus, living for Jesus, that's a sign that you are going to have a good marriage. That's a sign. But you don't have time for Christ. When the time will come for you to make a choice, it will be a time of crisis for you because you don't have Christ. You will just follow your feelings into trouble. 
your feelings will hold you like this and drag you into a problem. And you will be having that problem every day. You won't know where to go. I beg you in the name of the Lord, cool down, relax, learn of the Lord. Don't make such decisions carelessly. Pray, ask God for mercy. <laughs> if you know what people do, you will see, you will see women, they will move into a man's house. They are not married though, they will move into a man's house and they will have four children, five children in that kind of settings. That same woman will now be saying that he, the man has been cheating on her. <laughs> I'm like, so you expect this man to be responsible. A man that, that, that does not see the need to do the right thing, to follow due process to marry a woman. You expect that man to be responsible. I, I, I can't understand how some people are thinking. So you expect that he will be faithful to you. A man that you just met, he said he liked you. The next thing you move into his house. Then you now say, yeah, I've, you have been telling him to go and pay your buy price. Why didn't you allow him to pay buy price before you move into his house? Why couldn't you do the right thing? You are not saying he's not responsible, he has not paid the right price. You don't see yourself as being irresponsible. And then you want the man, then you say, you never know joy in this marriage. How will you know joy? Is that how to marry? You just move him into a man's house. And then you expect that man to be responsible, to be loving, to be perfect. <laughs> Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophet which were before you. I just want to point to you that our response to suffering for Christ must be rejoicing. It must not be depression. It must not be shameful. It must not be feeling ashamed. It must be, Jesus said, what should we do? We should rejoice. So you see that it's not a bad thing. Can you be rejoicing for something bad? No. That's how we should rejoice. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. It's a privilege. Let your response be rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, we did a, a, a teaching on the fact that Jesus came to make us to live contrary to the human sinful nature. The normal part of a sinful nature is when you suffer, you become depressed, you become sad. But the way in the, we live in the kingdom is that when we face suffering, we rejoice and we are exceedingly glad. <laughs> do we really know this this way do we really understand what we say we believe have we truly come to believe in Jesus are you sure you are truly walking in Jesus are you sure it's what we are reading in scriptures that is your life let us pray Hope you have not been offended that you have gone through some tough situations and then you are angry with God. You didn't even know it was part of your own token of mark of identification with Christ. But today you've now realized it. My counsel to you is that go before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for feeling bad towards you. Jesus said, blessed is he that is not offended because of me. But you have become offended. Say, well, Lord, why is this? Lord, why am I going through this? Lord, why me? Lord, why this? Your heart is sort of bitter towards the Lord. Why not go before the Lord today and say, Father, deliver me from this bitterness. I'm sorry. Give me a spirit of rejoicing and exceeding gladness. 
thank him for counting you worthy to suffer shame for his namesake. To suffer misunderstanding. To suffer troubles. They say, look at this one. He, he, he has nothing to post on his titles. It's just Jesus, 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 Jesus. They, are, they, they have brainwashed this one. Yes, Jesus has cleansed our brain. Our brain has been washed in the blood of Jesus. It is now functioning well. That's why we have been given a spirit of sound mind and power. Thank him that he has counted you worthy to suffer shame, to suffer on behalf of Christ, to suffer on account of Jesus, to suffer because of Jesus. You have lost opportunities because of Jesus. You've lost money. You've lost land. You've lost material wealth because of Jesus. Because you took a stand for Jesus. Some, some things that could bring money to you that require only a single lie, a single falsehood, you refused and you have lost so much money. Thank him that he has counted you worthy. Say, Lord, I praise your name. Thank you that you made me part of your suffering. Please, if you are single and you are not married, I want you to pray and say, Father, help me not to get it wrong. Let your mercy speak for me, Lord. Do to me everything that is needed for me to marry right. May I not enter into a wrong marriage. Lord, please deliver me. If the, some of you may be in a relationship. Say, Lord, if this relationship is going to lead to situationship, Father, please break us. In your mercy, confuse our language. Lord, don't let it work out. Be merciful to me. I may not even know. I may think that I'm on the right path. But I beg you, O oh Lord, be merciful to me. Let me not enter into a wrong marriage. That trap that Satan is setting for single Christians, may I not fall into it, O oh Lord. Help me to scale it, O oh Lord. Give me wisdom and patience of spirit. Not to take decision in a haste. Not to idolize marriage in my heart. Let my life be about pleasing you. About living for you. About serving you. Thank him for his graciousness. Thank him for his mercy. Let's pray for those who are hurting, who are aching in marriage. They may have made mistake out of ignorance or disobedience. But they are crying to God. They are saying, Lord, be merciful to us. Let's remember our brothers and sisters who may be having serious heartbreak, frustration, and pain in marriage, that God in his mercy, he will visit such. He will turn their situations around for good. Just like Joseph, what, the, what his brother meant for evil, that the Lord will turn it for their good. They may have allowed Satan to succeed in scheming them into a wrong marriage. But let's ask God to turn it for their good. That Lord, you will visit this once, you will comfort their heart. That peace will reign in their homes. You will turn their heart to Jesus. For that is the only way peace can reign. You will look down from heaven and show them mercy. Thank him for hearing us. Thank him for showing us mercy once again. Give him all the glory. Give him all the praise. Let's round up our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.